Monitoring Sedation by Dr. Aaron Calhoun, in collaboration with the Society for Pediatric Sedation. Welcome to the Society for Pediatric Sedation's online provider course on appropriate sedation monitoring. Different levels of sedation require different monitoring strategies to ensure safety, and different procedures require different levels of sedation. Our goal in this lecture is to teach the knowledge base necessary to choose appropriate monitoring for each of these levels of sedation. Emphasis will be placed on respiratory monitoring as most sedation-related adverse events are respiratory in nature. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the effects of sedative drugs on upper respiratory tone and respiratory drive. Describe the monitoring requirements based on sedation depth, Explain the principles, applications, and limitations of monitoring devices, such as pretracheal stethoscope, the pulse oximeter, and the capnograph. In addition to this, you should feel comfortable interpreting the data derived from both pulse oximetry and capnography. This lecture is divided into three major subsections or modules. The first deals with the physiological basis for the adverse drug effects most commonly seen during sedation. The second will address the recommendations for monitoring, based primarily on the guidelines from the AAP and ASA. The third will address specific monitoring modalities, including strengths and limitations. We begin with the consideration of the respiratory effects of sedatives. First, it must be recognized that all sedatives suppress central nervous system function. Indeed, this is their intended role, as it is this effect that results in the desired level of sedation. Unfortunately, no drug currently exists that only suppresses the desired functions of consciousness and pain sensitivity without simultaneously risking the depression of other, more basic functions, such as ventilatory control and airway tone. These events represent the two most common complications of sedative administration with impaired airway control representing the single most serious adverse event of these medications. Here it is important to recognize that the depth of sedation is a continuum, with unwanted side effects playing a more prominent role as greater depths of sedation are attained. The detection and early treatment of these events represents the primary goal of appropriate monitoring. By uncovering hypoventilation and or airway obstruction early, Interventions can be initiated to protect the patient from the possibility of subsequent hypoxia. So, what is the prevalence of these events? In both 2006 and 2009, the Pediatric Sedation Research Consortium conducted studies that yielded approximately 50,000 sedation encounters from a wide array of disparate clinical centers. In these studies, airway obstruction due to either pharyngeal collapse due to poor muscle tone or laryngospasm emerged as the top clinically significant adverse events. Apnea and aspiration of secretions due to inhibited airway reflexes were second and third. All of these events point to a common adverse event pathway where diminished airway control or central drive lead to hypoventilation that subsequently results in systemic hypoxemia. The next several slides illustrate the physiologic and anatomic causes of upper airway obstruction and diminished ventilatory drive. In order to understand the cause of pharyngeal collapse referenced above, it is important to consider the structure and innervation of the upper airway. The airway can be divided into the nasal, pharyngeal, and laryngeal segments. The pharyngeal segment is a distensible muscular tube innervated by cranial nerves 9, 10, and 12. As the sedation level increases, the tone of these three cranial nerves diminishes, leading to collapse of the pharyngeal segment and upper airway obstruction. These anatomical distinctions have been superimposed on a pediatric CT image in order to better depict their exact location. Keeping in mind the previous image, the difference in pharyngeal segment caliber can be easily seen by comparing the MRI image on the left with the MRI image on the right. Both images were performed in children receiving deep sedation with propofol. The image on the right, however, was performed in the presence of a chin lift. This serves to illustrate the anatomical changes that occur during sedation-related upper airway obstruction 
and the changes in airway caliber that can occur with simple airway maneuvers like a chin lift. In addition to their efforts on airway patency, sedatives also directly affect the brainstem response to high carbon dioxide levels. This graph depicts the effect of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide on brainstem generated minute ventilation. The white line shows the normal relationship. As sedation is applied and deepened, however, the relationship changes and the curve shifts to the right with decreased brainstem generated minute ventilation at similar levels of carbon dioxide as seen in moderate sedation. Note that with deep sedation, not only does the minute ventilation decrease for a given CO2 value, but the degree of brainstem ventilator response is less, as demonstrated by a reduction in the slope of the curve. The practical effect on this, on monitoring, can be seen when we examine the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. This sigmoidal curve depicts the relationship between bound oxygen, as measured by oxygen saturation plethysmography, and arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Under normal conditions, oxygen saturations and oxygen partial pressure are close to 100. With correspondingly normal ventilation, as represented by an arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 millimeters of mercury and a pH of 7.4. When sedated, however, the arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide rises and the arterial partial pressure of oxygen drops due to diminished ventilatory response causing the patient's location on the curve to shift leftward, as represented by the pH of 7.25, arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 60 millimeters of mercury, and arterial partial pressure of oxygen of 70 millimeters of mercury, with 91% saturation. Most sedation providers would address this by adding supplemental oxygen, resulting in a rightward shift of arterial partial pressure of oxygen and an increase in saturation. Note, however, that this does not affect the arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and thus impaired ventilation often coexists with supported oxygenation. This illustrates the primary rationale for capnography monitoring, which allows direct assessment of ventilation. Because of these considerations, the American Society of Anesthesiology, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Joint Commission have released sedation guidelines addressing the definition of sedation level and the appropriate monitoring for each level. In each recommendation, the definitions of sedation levels are discussed. In addition, each of these organizations has emphasized the sedation provider's responsibility in early recognition of an impending event to facilitate swift rescue. Monitoring recommendations are based on the depth of sedation, the nature of the procedure, and the patient's clinical status. One way to categorize a patient's clinical status is by using the American Society of Anesthesiology illness classification levels. The first principle considered in these recommendations is the respiratory nature of most adverse sedation events. Hemodynamic disturbance are typically minimal. Therefore, monitoring requirements primarily focus on the assessment of oxygenation and ventilation. When monitoring oxygenation, the recommendations recognize the cause of hypoxia is typically due to reduced respiratory drive and airway tone with a subsequent rise in CO2. Thus, monitoring recommendations require the need to maintain an oxygenation saturation of greater than or equal to 90%. This value assures adequate delivery to tissues with sufficient margin to remain above the steep portion of the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. In order to detect oxygen desaturations, should it arise, pulse oximetry is required. Given the ability of supplemental oxygen to mask hypoventilation, pulse oximetry alone is not enough. Thus, some means must be employed to measure both respiratory frequency and adequacy of ventilation. Suggested means vary based on level of sedation and include observation, auscultation, and the use of capnography or a pretracheal stethoscope. Both the AAP and ASA guidelines recommend monitoring requirements based on the level of sedation. On this slide, where noted, the ASA recommends additional monitoring. For minimal sedation, observation and intermittent assessment by a responsible practitioner is adequate. As the sedation level increases to moderate, higher levels of monitoring are required 
including continuous pulse oximetry, heart rate, and respiratory rate with the intermittent recording of vital signs. Additionally, the responsible practitioner is advised to designate a support person who may perform other tasks but could be available quickly if needed. For deep sedation, the recommendations for moderate sedation hold with the addition of further continuous measurement of ventilation using either capnography or pretracheal stethoscopy. The ASA also recommends electrocardiogram monitoring for deep sedation. For deep sedation, support personnel must also forego other tasks as the potential for an adverse event is higher. Monitoring should continue until the patient returns to their baseline status. In 2012, a study was performed to obtain a sense of what monitoring modalities are in most use among institutions belonging to the PSRC. Averaged over 114,855 cases, 95% used pulse oximetry, 87% used non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, 67% used continuous ECG monitoring, 45% used capnography, 20% used impedance plethysmography, and 0.22% used a pretracheal stethoscope. We now progress to a discussion of the specific tools used to monitor ventilation and oxygenation. This slide depicts the physiologic sites at which monitoring occurs, their typical normal values, and their comparison to the gold standard, the arterial blood gas. Oxygenation is measured via pulse oximetry at the arterial level. Unfortunately, no sensor currently exists that can measure arterial carbon dioxide non-invasively. Capnography functions as a proxy for this by measuring the estimated alveolar partial pressure of carbon dioxide as determined from exhale to air. Such values can be 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury lower than the arterial partial pressures of carbon dioxide. Pretracheal stethoscopy, which provides continuous auscultation of airflow, allows the practitioner to maintain an ongoing breath-to-breath -breath assessment of airflow through the upper airway and a qualitative sense of ventilation. It is important to know the operating principles for each tool. Pulse oximetry is based on the differential absorption spectra of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and uses the pulsatile nature of arterial blood flow to enable the extraction of absorption data. This is illustrated here. Two light-emitting diodes tuned to the specific absorption wavelengths of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, shine light through a peripheral tissue bed to a photodetector on the other side. With each pulse of arterial blood, the ratio of transmitted light shifts, enabling the pulse oximeter to determine which parts of the absorption spectra are related to arterial flow and subsequently convert that data into an estimated saturation. Given this mechanism, the pulse oximeter cannot directly detect PO2, although under normal conditions, an estimated PO2 can be obtained from the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. Additionally, several abnormal forms of hemoglobin can confound the sensor due to different absorption spectra, carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin being the most common. Given the necessity of a peripheral pulse, the pulse oximeter is also limited under circumstances of poor perfusion. A number of other limitations to pulse oximetry also exist. For example, motion artifact caused by venous compression and subsequent surges in venous blood flow can cause the sensor to overestimate the, the amount of venous blood present, which can inappropriately decrease the measured arterial oxygen saturation. Newer models do exist with processing algorithms that can address this issue. Additionally, a 15 to 25 second time delay between central desaturation and its peripheral measurement by pulse oximetry also exists. This can, if not recognized, mislead sedation providers. Finally, below a saturation of 70%, the accuracy of measurement becomes subject to significant fluctuation. When considering monitoring of ventilation, it is important to remember the arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide to minute ventilation curve, as this demonstrates why monitoring respiratory rate is inadequate. Likewise, visual inspection of breathing is a poor monitoring modality, as periods of apnea are easy to miss. For these reasons, the Joint Commission recommends monitoring both respiratory rate and adequacy of ventilation.
and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends pretracheal stethoscopy or capnography monitoring for difficult to observe patients. The pretracheal stethoscope chest piece pictured here is an innovative means to allow a clinician continuous auditory monitoring of ventilation. By taping this stethoscope to the skin adjacent to the patient's trachea, a continuous qualitative assessment of ventilation can be performed. One useful adjunct to the pretracheal stethoscope is the Strider score, depicted here. In a clinical study assessing upper airway caliber by MRI in propofol sedated children, auscultation of the trachea determined four levels of Strider. The scale begins with normal breath sounds and progresses through Strider to auscultation only, through audible Strider, and ends in complete airway obstruction with lack of air sounds. This Strider score was shown to correlate with pharyngeal airway diameter and hence with level of obstruction. A more commonly used tool for measuring ventilation is capnography. This technique is based on the infrared absorption of gaseous carbon dioxide and can be used to both measure the concentration of carbon dioxide in exhaled air and the frequency and flow of exhalation, which corresponds to important ventilatory parameters. This image depicts a typical capnography waveform that is time-based. Proper interpretation of this waveform can provide information on quality of airflow and ventilation, as well as information regarding the patient's circulatory status. This monitoring modality has several advantages when compared to pulse oximetry, including a lack of lag time and motion artifact. Additionally, capnography is not dependent on peripheral circulation and thus is reliable even in situations of diminished peripheral perfusion. Note, however, that end tidal CO2 values may be lower under conditions of poor pulmonary blood flow seen in cardiopulmonary arrest and pulmonary embolus. Looking closer at the waveform, it is possible to break down the shape of the wave into four segments. Note the dotted line on the graph depicts the normal CO2 value of the arterial blood. Segment one occurs at the beginning of exhalation and represents the carbon dioxide content of the dead space gas present in the trachea and mainstem bronchi, essentially that of room air. Section two occurs early and mid exhalation and appears as a rapid upstroke in the exhaled carbon dioxide concentration. This represents the phase of exhalation when dead space gases are rapidly mixed with alveolar gas. Phase three begins when the exhaled carbon dioxide level plateaus and represents nearly pure alveolar gas. This is the true end tidal carbon dioxide measurement. Finally, in phase four, the levels of carbon dioxide fall rapidly during inspiration. This phase merges with phase one of the next breath. The breath-to-breath -breath analysis provided by this technique allows the clinician to assess several important respiratory states, including complete airflow of cessation due to apnea or complete obstruction, or the changes in exhaled carbon dioxide concentration that occur with slow or shallow respirations. With the complete airflow cessation that occurs during apnea or complete airway obstruction, the end tidal tracing will abruptly discontinue. In contrast, hypoventilation caused by diminished respiratory drive, where the normal tidal volumes are still present, will often appear as a gradually rising end tidal plateau due to increasing serum and alveolar carbon dioxide levels. Finally, hypoventilation due to shallow respirations will present with a gradually diminishing plateau. This is caused by a lack of full exhalation resulting in a greater proportion of dead space ventilation with each breath. Although the end tidal value decreases in this state, the patient's arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide level rises due to the incomplete exhalation and resulting diminished alveolar gas exchange. End tidal monitoring does have limitations, however. For example, if a patient tends to breathe through their mouth preferentially, the majority of the exhaled gas will not pass by the detector, resulting in an artificially low tracing. Additionally, the use of supplemental oxygen may provide high enough gas flow rates to dilute the exhaled gas, also diminishing the measured value. Finally, any obstruction in the tubing by which the exhaled carbon dioxide is sampled will result in intermittent or absent readings. Despite these limitations, numerous studies have indicated that capnography monitoring 
when performed in tandem with pulse oximetry results in earlier detection of apnea and airway obstruction and can lead to swifter intervention, ultimately leading to a reduction in hypoxemic episodes. When considering hemodynamic monitoring, it is important to remember that sedatives usually have no to minimal clinically significant effects on hemodynamic status. This effect, however, is drug specific. Here, an appreciation of the patient's underlying condition is important, as patients with cardiovascular disease are at higher risk for hemodynamic decompensation when sedated. Note that even when sedation-related hemodynamic effects become clinically significant, it often does not correlate with the level of sedation. Because of this, current recommendations state that intermittent monitoring of blood pressure at five-minute intervals is appropriate for moderate and deep sedation. Greater vigilance is needed for patients with hypovolemia, cardiac dysfunction, or significant severity of illness defined by the ASA score of three or higher, as these patients are at enhanced risk for hemodynamic compromise. A final consideration is continuous electrocardiogram monitoring. This monitoring modality gives an additional source of heart rate data that can be used to validate the rate given by the pulse oximeter. Given the reality of frequent pulse oximeter artifact, this can be an invaluable source of information. Although the American Academy of Pediatrics has no specific recommendations for electrocardiogram monitoring, the American Society of Anesthesiology recommends its use in all deep sedation cases and in those patients undergoing moderate sedation with either a specific cardiac disease history or that are having a procedure associated with a greater risk of developing dysrhythmias. In summary, appropriate monitoring is a vital component of sedation practice. Monitoring modalities should be selected based on sedation depth, the patient's clinical status, and the procedure for which sedation is being performed. Most common sedation adverse events are respiratory in nature, and the use of pulse oximetry and capnography can provide vital information about patient oxygenation and ventilation during the sedation. The use of capnography is an especially important consideration as it can provide an early warning for ventilatory issues, allowing for intervention before clinically significant hypoxia occurs. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.